Okay, um, you're all very welcome to the keynote and Turia lectures for Lund, the Philosophy Dagarna in Lund 2022. Uh, I'm Christer Bickvist. I'm professor of practical philosophy at Stockholm University and a research fellow at the Institute for Future Studies in Stockholm as well. Just going to say initially a few words about Teoria. It's a Swedish philosophy journal. It was founded 1935. In the beginning, it was written mainly in Swedish, I think in German too, but now it's uh, English uh, only, in fact. Uh, in the beginning, we had three issues per year. Now it's eight issues, it, it's an, and it's only also online, actually, so you can find it online. And I should say that we especially invite uh, contributions from Swedish philosophers, and also not just contribution, actually, but also suggestions for special issues. So if you have any ideas about some special issues, contact the chief editor, Sven Ove Hansson, and he will ponder and think about it. Yeah, so I should also say I'm here now. Why am I talking? Why am I inviting you for this? I'm actually uh, the chair of the board of the Theoria Foundation. Should have added that, so you know why I'm standing here. Yeah, so the speaker, we are very, very pleased to introduce uh, Christian List. Uh, I guess many of you uh, will know of him already, but I'm going to give a little introduction for you who, who doesn't know him very well. So he's a professor of philosophy and decision theory and the co-director of Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy. Uh, and both are at LMU in Munich. He was previously at London School of Economics, professor of philosophy and political science. So his work is sort of in the intersection of uh, philosophy, economics and political science. So that's the, the general sort of rubric. And um, in my sort of one of my special fields, population ethics, we have a hard time making trade-offs between the quality of the lives of populations and the quantity. Um, and they're always a trade-off. Here you have a counterexample to that you always have to make the, such trade-offs when it comes to research input. Uh, you have the quantity, it's over 100 uh, publications and two books, and the quality is just amazing. A lot of groundbreaking and a lot of really important contributions to a lot of subfields uh, within this sort of intersection I just mentioned. So, for instance, you start off doing quite a lot of work in social choice theory and theory of democracy um, and the political philosophy as well, so on, on freedom and methodology. Judgment aggregation is one pet topic, and you've done a lot of work with Frank Dietrich on this, and I think there's a book in the pipeline with, with him on, on the judgment aggregation. But also issues about rationality, <coughs> reasons, uh, where we also use tools from social choice theory to enlighten sort of this also about the structure of reasons. So more recently, you have sort of had a metaphysical turn and gotten into issues about social uh, ontology and group agency. And here it's a, a very important book you co-authored with uh, Philip Pettit, um, entitled Group Agency, OUP 2011. I really recommend you to read that. And here you can find uh, you actually applying some stuff from the judgment aggregation uh, discussion to this particular issue about group agency. And then I think even more recently, you applied views about uh, the fact that you, these group agency, the groups can have this agency in their own right to a sort of an analogy with AI system, arguing that actually AI systems can also be uh, agencies in their own right, because they have very and all analogous features if you compare it to sort of group uh, agents. But something that comes closer to today's topic then is your work on free will and causation. And here we have the book Why Free Will is Real, which came out um, in 2019 and was actually a big splash, in fact. <laughs> Such a big splash, you got actually an award for that, the Joseph B. Gitler Award of the American Philosophical Association for outstanding scholarly contribution in the field of the philosophy of one or more of the social sciences. And in your case, it's more than one, I would say, actually. Uh, just to end off with some sort of um, comments on your approach. I mean, one thing which I've just sort of illustrated, I think, is that you have this sort of ability to find surprising connections between different subfields of philosophy things that we haven't really recognized that 
judgment aggregation stuff can actually be very relevant to group agency discussions and social, social ontology. And also, you are very constructive in your approach. I mean, I've had many discussions with you when I come with sort of half-baked ideas and you provide a framework, you provide possible solutions, a ways to de develop these half-baked ideas. And I think that's what you do, not just with me, but also in general in the philosophical community when you write papers, uh, and which creates a lot of original uh, ideas. Because you're not happy just finding a crushing counterexample. You actually want to do something constructive uh, with philosophy. And you do it quite often by employing models. So modeling in philosophy is something you're keen on. I think that's a very important part of a good philosophy to use sort of simplified models where you can sort of manipulate things, ignore certain complexities, and actually give some precision in our answers, which is, of course, something you're also famous for, the high level of precision in your philosophy. Yeah, so this brings me to today's uh, topic then, or your talk, which is on metaphysics of free will, and the title is Agential Indeterminism. Welcome. <laughs> Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for this uh, extremely generous uh, and, and kind introduction. And also, thank you very much for um, inviting me. It's a wonderful pleasure and, and honor to be at this uh, conference. Um, I was saying to people, this is actually my first in-person conference trip since the pandemic. So it's very fitting that um, it is to Sweden. And uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, Swedish philosophy. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Okay, agential indeterminism. As you all know, there is a lot of discussion on whether free will is compatible with determinism. Compatibilists about free will argue that it is, and incompatibilists um, argue that it isn't. For incompatibilists in particular, free will requires the possibility of doing otherwise, um, and this in turn, um, they think, requires some form of indeterminism. Compatibilists, on the other hand, think that actions can count as free in some other sense, even when there is no possibility of doing otherwise. For instance, the sense could be that the actions are owned by the agent, or they are endorsed by the agent, or the agent stands in some kind of counterfactual relationship to the action, in that if the agent's mental state were a little bit different, the action would have been somewhat different. All of this can be true, even against the background of determinism, and so that's how they come to their conflicting views about the compatibility of free will and determinism. Now, this is a widely appreciated debate, um, <clears throat> but there is much less discussion on whether agency itself is compatible with determinism. And given how central the idea of agency is to our self-understanding as humans in the world, and also to practically all of the human and social sciences and the humanities uh, also as well, this question, I think, is hardly less important than the question about free will. And so I want to ask in this talk, could there be genuine intentional agency in a deterministic world? So here's the plan. Um, I will begin um, with an argument um, that uh, Helen Stewart uh, has um, recently developed for a position she calls agency incompatibilism, the view that there can be no agency in a deterministic uh, world. I'll um, present a quick overview of uh, Stewart's argument and position. I'll then revisit Stewart's premises and offer a little bit of a critique of um, her argument. But I'll then suggest that there is an alternative naturalistic argument for a somewhat related position, which um, arrives at a rather similar conclusion, though subtly different in some important nuances, as you'll see. Um, and in particular, the upshot will be that some form of agential indeterminism is needed for agency, as you'll see. And then I'll argue whether this is, or then I'll ask whether this is compatible with physical determinism. Okay. So let's begin with Stuart's argument. <clears throat> now, many philosophers think that, there, um, that if there is any challenge from determinism at all, it is really a challenge for free will, not for agency itself. Um, presumably, anyone who is a free will compatibilist, and according to various surveys of professional philosophers, that I think is the majority among professional philosophers, 
anyone of this disposition will think that determinism poses no challenge for agency, given that it poses no challenge for free agency. But I think even free will incompatibilists um, can hold the view that determinism um, conflicts only with free agency and not with agency itself. And I've had lots of discussions with free will um, incompatibilists, even with some hard incompatibilists who think that free will uh, is compatible neither with determinism nor with indeterminism. But their worries really are about freedom and about notions such as ultimate responsibility, and then this also has repercussions for their views about retributivism and punishment, and all of these are very important debates. But many of them, I think, have no uh, objection to saying that even in a deterministic world, um, there, there can be intentional agents. But contrary to this view, Helen Stewart has recently defended this position that she calls agency incompatibilism. Now, on this view, determinism doesn't merely render our actions unfree, but, she says, there could be no agents or actions at all in a deterministic world. And now I'll <coughs> explain uh, how she comes to this uh, conclusion. Uh, she defends this view in a series of contributions, most notably um, her 2012 book, A Metaphysics for Freedom, which I highly recommend. Now, if Stuart is right, then determinism clearly poses an even greater threat to our conventional understanding of the place of humans in the world uh, than typically recognized by incompatibilists about uh, free will. So determinism would really shake the foundations of our conventional um, picture of uh, uh, you know, what is distinctive about us as humans. For, for Stuart, either the world is indeterministic or there is no agency. So these are the two uh, possible routes we can take. Stuart accepts the existence of, of agents um, and so she embraces indeterminism. Now, central to Stuart's case for agency incompatibilism is um, the so-called argument from settling. In particular, Stuart has a, a particular understanding of agency, namely she thinks of agents as self-moving entities. And to be a self-mover is to have the ability to settle certain matters and thereby to close off certain previously open possibilities. And I, I'll now describe this idea um, a bit further um, using uh, Stuart's own words. She says, the idea is that of some matter being up to a given creature or system. When I move my body, I settle certain questions concerning how it will move that until then had not been settled. I move right rather than left, for instance, or I move quickly rather than slowly. It was possible until the time of action that I should have moved left, so the opposite direction, or that I should have moved slowly rather than quickly. But as I move, I close off these possibilities and settle what is to be the nature of uh, actuality. So I think the idea is pretty clear. Before you take the action, there is an ensemble of possibilities open to you, and then you interject your action into the world and you close off some of these possibilities, thereby having settled some matters. That's it, basically. And if agency requires self-movement in this sense, then the exercise of agency is possible only if there are matters to be settled, clearly, and the conflict between determinism and agency arises. If nothing in the universe is left to be settled, once the physical past is given, which is what determinism seems to imply, um, then the exercise of agency is impossible in such a universe. Stuart also expresses a, a similar idea in terms of the notion of a two-way power. Specif specifically, she says, an action which it is not possible for the agent not to perform is not a performance um, at, at all. So uh, even to speak of, of an action, you've got to be able to do it or not do it, you know, settle things one way or settle things the other way, otherwise it's just not a performance of, of an action. And again, those genuine two-way powers that she thinks are involved in action are only possible in worlds in which there are still matters open to be settled. So Stuart's argument can then be summarized in premise conclusion form, and again, I adapt her own wording. <coughs> premise one, an action is the settling of certain matters by an agent at the time of action. Premise two, 
there could be no settling of matters by agents at the time of action if determinism were true. Conclusion, there could be no agents or actions at all in a deterministic world. Now, I think this is a perfectly um, fine uh, argument. And under the reasonable assumption that there could be no agents without actions, it's clearly formally valid. Um, so we must either accept the agency and compatibilist conclusion um, or reject at least one of the premises. Now, Stuart suggests that the premises are supported by two things, philosophical analysis on the one hand, from coming from action theory, and folk psychological intuitions about agency on the other. But still, I want to examine the premises for the moment to see whether we should really um, accept the argument from settling to, to make the case for agency and compatibilism. So, um, critics have noted um, that compatibilists about agency need not accept um, Stuart's metaphysically very demanding account of agency, and they can instead adopt a different account under which one or both of Stuart's premises are false. So, one nice critique of um, Stuart's argument can be found in this article by Karen Boxer from 2013, assessing the argument for agency and compatibilism, which I also recommend uh, as a contribution to this debate. Um, now, there are, broadly speaking, two roots or families of roots. The first is to concede that an action involves the settling of certain matters, but to deny that such settling is ruled out by determinism. In particular, a compatibilist could adopt a less demanding account of settling. Um, so, for instance, one route that um, I find quite appealing would be to define settling in terms of difference-making causation without any reference to the closing off of possibility. And my former PhD student, Johannes Himmelreich, for instance, wrote an, a, a very nice dissertation on, on agency as uh, difference-making in which he defends precisely this uh, picture of agency. So I stand in the, uh, in the agency relation to a particular action if my action-directed mental state, the relevant intention is the difference-making cause of this action. So we could then say an agent settles the matter of whether to do X or Y if the agent's action-directed mental state is the difference-making cause of his or her doing X rather than Y. Now, this would retain the idea that agency would involve a kind of two-way power in the choice between uh, X and Y, but it would spell this out compatibilistically. And clearly, there can be difference-making causation even in a deterministic world. I mean, we've got um, familiar analyses of the, uh, this available in the literature, for instance, using counterfactuals, as in Lewis's work, um, or interventionist modeling, as in the work of Judea Pearl or Jim Woodward. Now, if one were to define settling, in these um, uh, more compatibilist terms, then one would be able to reject Stuart's second premise, namely that determinism rules out the settling of certain matters, while still holding on to the um, first premise, namely that action involved the settling of matters. Okay, so that's one way in which one could go. The second route. Um, now, this is to deny that agency and action should be defined in terms of settling at all. So the compatibilist um, might say agency and action should really be defined in terms of notions such as intentionality, rationality, or reasons. Um, and so this parallels the way in which some free will compatibilists, um, for instance, interpret this famous example of um, Martin Luther reaffirming his criticism of the Roman Catholic Church. So he was summoned to the Reichstag in Worms and was asked to take a stand on his criticism of the church. Do you um, reaffirm it or do you renounce it? Um, and uh, Luther reaffirmed his criticism and said, um, here I stand, I can do no other. Now, if we literally interpret him as saying it was impossible for him to act otherwise, which is an interpretation that not everyone shares, but if we take that view, then um, it would look like here he is um, taking 
agency, ownership, authorship of his action, despite not being able to close off any possibility. So renouncing was never a possibility for him. It was just not um, in line with his character and motives. But still, we wouldn't deny his, his agency. So you get the point. Um, and this definition might actually be closer to our folk psychological understanding of agency anyway. So if one takes reasons and intentional endorsement to be at the center of our folk psychological picture of agency instead of settling, then one might be in a position to reject Stuart's first premise that actions involve the settling of certain matters, regardless of one's view on the second um, premise, namely that determinism rules out such, uh, such settling. Okay, so up to this point, um, I think we've seen that there are some compatibilist responses available to the argument from settling. And so this argument doesn't quite settle the question of whether determinism rules out agency. And so therefore, I want to now consider an alternative argument for the claim that agency requires some form of, um, of indeterminism. And this, this takes me to my alternative naturalistic argument. Now, in a nutshell, the alternative argument, which I'm then going to develop in a little bit more detail, asserts two things. First, as soon as we ascribe agency to someone or something, for instance, to a person or an entity, and we explain his, her, or its behavior in, in, in intentional terms, we are forced to presuppose a relevant form of indeterminism. So, in a nutshell, the attribution of uh, agency comes with a presupposition of a certain form of indeterminism. And the second claim is if we then adopt a realist view of agency and don't treat agency merely as an instrumentally useful fiction or a projection of the observer's or explainer's mind, we are then by implication also forced to adopt the realist view of the implied form of indeterminism. Obviously, if agency involves an appropriate form of indeterminism, then you can't be a realist about agency without being a realist about the implied form of indeterminism. Okay, so that those are the, the key claims. Now to present this argument, let's suppose we've come to view a particular person or a particular entity as an agent, and we explain this person's or this entity's behavior in intentional terms, which of course is what we routinely do in the case of human behavior or even animal behavior. Now consider questions such as, why does this agent act in such and such a way? Or what would he or she or it do in a given situation? <clears throat> so for example, why does this person get married? Why does this person vote the way they do? Standard question in political science. Um, why does this person choose one particular consum consumption bundle on the market over another? Standard question in economics. Or why is this person friendlier to, for instance, their neighbor rather than, uh, than to, a, to a stranger? Or you know, why is this person inclined to keep their promises in such and such a situation, but maybe not in such and such other situation? So these are all familiar questions, not just from ordinary life, but also from the uh, human and social sciences. Now, when we answer any such question, I think we either explicitly or at least implicitly engage in the following um, three-part um, uh, hypothetical reasoning. First of all, the agent is faced with some options, which are his or her or its possible choices. Secondly, the agent considers those options or deliberates about them, where this consideration or deliberation can take a variety of forms, ranging from slow and rational to fast and spontaneous. And then thirdly, the agent selects one option from amongst the possible ones in a way that is somehow um, intelligible or explicable, perhaps even approximately rational, given the agent's uh, mental state, given the agent's beliefs and desires. This explanatory scheme, which I suggest is either explicitly or implicitly involved in answering any of these questions about um, human behavior, simply presupposes, already in step one, that the agent has alternative possibilities to choose from. 
So to make it again a little bit more concrete, let's return to these questions I mentioned earlier. You know, why does this person get married? Why do they vote the way they do, and so on? Now, um, each of these questions already, at least implicitly, has a sort of contrastive form. Um, so you know, why does this person get married rather than not get married? Why does did this person vote for Trump rather than Biden, for for instance? So there's always this contrastive form, and we um, want to explain why they did one thing rather than, rather than another. Now, an intentional explanation of the behaviors in question typically refers, and this can be mm, informal or it could also be more formal, to the agent's um, reasons or preferences or utilities or you know, whichever concept you prefer um, in favor of some actions and against others, or in relative comparison of these actions vis-a-vis -vis one another, or it compares ex the expected utility of different um, actions. But any of these schemes, you know, whether they are relatively informal intentional explanation, or the highly formalized sort that we find in areas such as decision theory or game theory as explanatory theories, these just wouldn't get off the ground if we didn't suppose that people make choices between different alternative options in the first place. I mean, you cannot formulate decision-theoretic explanations or even their informal, purely verbal, discursive analogs without having non-singleton option sets or menus of options uh, that you take there to be in front of the agent. And even in economics and orthodox rational choice theory, with an at first sight mechanistic picture of people as maximizers of utility, um, <coughs> the notion of choice between different options is uh, still absolutely central. So here the presupposition is that agents sometimes face choices. And when they do, more than one option is in principle possible for them, even if only some of the options are rational. So an agent's trajectory up to any relevant choice node admits different agentially possible continuations. That's sort of the, the core idea here. And let's call this thesis agential indeterminism. Now this idea can be illustrated um, by considering an extensive form decision tree of the sort that is modeled in decision and game theory. I'm sure um, uh, most of you, all of you have seen these trees. So such a tree represents all the possible decision paths that the relevant agent or agents could take, moving from bottom to top. So each of these dots is a decision node. The agent could either go left or right. And then any trajectory that takes you through this path is um, um, a possible world in uh, this uh, you know, world of decision making described by, by such an extensive form tree. And indeed, um, if we do a modal logic analysis of um, such um, decision problems or such games, we would treat uh, the different possible trajectories through the tree as the different possible worlds. So the set omega of possible worlds would simply consist of all the possible paths that can be taken from bottom to, to top. Now, once you have a theory in play um, or in place maybe with some uh, concept of rationality or with some equilibrium concept, then this theory might pick out a particular path as the predicted one or as the rational one and might say, well, under certain assumptions about rationality, this is the path that the theory predicts this agent will rationally take. Um, and so the red path here might have been singled out as rational, for instance, by our theory's um, solution concept. But even if one path is identified as rational, the other paths um, remain entirely possible. And indeed, um, in game theory, it's actually very important to also treat off-equilibrium paths as genuine possibilities. You know, ones which, under certain rationality assumptions, maybe won't realize in actuality if the agents are all rational, but they are still considered possibilities that could, in principle, albeit counter-rationally, um, happen. And Vlodek and I actually have a um, paper on 
uh, alternative possibilities and intentional endorsement in which we um, discuss in detail this uh, distinction between um, possible paths and, uh, and, and, and rational uh, ones or, in, or rationally endorsed ones. Now, agential indeterminism, so this thesis that at any relevant choice node, um, the uh, agent's trajectory um, admits different agentially possible continuations, um, that thesis doesn't mean that choices are random. So, it, uh, so it, it, uh, there's no claim here that you know, agents somehow at each choice node uh, should be viewed as randomizers, as coin tosses, or something like this. It merely means precisely what uh, the definition also says it means, namely that agents face choices between different options that are in principle possible for them. They have a non-singleton option set. That's really what it, uh, what it means. Um, and this is consistent, as just noted, with some options or some continuations of the trajectory being rational and also with uh, being identified as rational in the agent's deliberation and other such trajectories not being rational. And this distinction between what is possible to do and what is rational to do is really very much at the heart of, um, of decision uh, theory. Indeed, if we didn't draw this distinction, decision uh, theory um, would become rather vacuous and trivial. I mean, decision theorists tend to think that the hypothesis that agents are expected utility maximizers, for instance, is distinct from the hypothesis that they're expected utility minimizers. But you know, were you to postulate that there are only ever singleton option sets, you wouldn't be able to make that distinction. So I mean, even to be able to distinguish different decision principles, which are all principles about picking out, let's say, rational or chosen options from amongst the possible ones, for distinguishing them, it is essential that you have non-singleton option sets in the first place. Um, and so um, I suggest that in, ten in intentional explanations of human behavior, um, both in this sort of highly formalized uh, version of decision and game theory, but also in the more informal intentional explanations that uh, are given maybe in some other areas of the social sciences, the assumption of non-singleton sets of possible options is often explanatorily indispensable. So we can now summarize um, the argument for a realist view of agential indeterminism, premise one. Our intentional explanations of an agent's behavior presuppose agential indeterminism. The agent has alternative possibilities to choose from. Premise two, realism about our best intentional explanations is warranted. Those explanations are true and not just instrumentally useful constructs or fictions or something else. Now, if we accept both of those premises, we get the conclusion that realism about agential indeterminism is warranted. There is agential indeterminism. Now, strictly speaking, in what I've said so far in this talk, I've only really given you an argument or uh, some considerations in support of uh, the first premise here, that intentional explanations presuppose agential indeterminism. I've not given you an argument for um, why realism about our best intentional explanations is warranted. Um, and here I really defer to the more general case for scientific realism. So th those, hopefully many of us, who um, are persuaded that scientific realism is um, really, or some version of it, is the, is the best philosophy of science, um, at least for well-established, explanatorily successful, mature theories, would be inclined to think that um, realism about what those theories say is warranted, provided the commitments of those theories um, don't really clash or conflict with some other commitments um, that are even more central or fundamental to us. And I think this case for scientific realism which um, I think is made most forcefully in relation to the natural sciences, of course, carries over also to um, the best branches of the human and social sciences. And um, so personally, I therefore think that just as we can be you know, naturalistic realists about um, some branches of physics, so we should be naturalistic realists about um, some 
uh, branches of the social sciences that are engaged in intentional explanation. But that's just a sort of background premise. So those who are thoroughgoing instrumentalists in the philosophy of science uh, will, of course, not be on board with this second premise here. Okay, some observations about this. Well, this argument explicitly refers to agential indeterminism in its conclusion. <coughs> Now, insofar as agential indeterminism need not be equated with physical indeterminism, the argument in principle still leaves open whether agency requires physical indeterminism, so indeterminism in the fundamental laws of um, physics, as I uh, think um, Stuart seems to think. So um, Stuart's argument from settling really um, targets not just um, an agential version of the determinism-indeterminism distinction, but really the sort of fundamental physical one that um, is relevant to the underlying physical laws of nature. But even the present argument supports the claim that agency requires some form of indeterminism, namely precisely an agential one. So there's this somewhat, um, let's say, weaker version of agency incompatibilism, namely an incompatibility between agency and agential determinism, that is established by this argument. <clears throat> and so this then takes us to the obvious question of whether agential indeterminism, which I now hope to have persuaded you or convinced you is uh, required for agency, whether this is compatible with physical determinism. Now, at first sight, one might think that there could not be agential indeterminism without physical indeterminism. So if the fundamental laws of nature turned out to be deterministic, this would then still undermine the possibility of, of agency. You know, may, maybe uh, agential indeterminism is only possible against the background of indeterministic physical laws. Now, physical determinism, very roughly speaking, this can be made uh, much, much more precise, is the thesis that the fully specified physical trajectory of the world, up to any time, admits only one possible future continuation under the laws of nature. Now, my response to this question uh, is that indeterminism at the level of agency is in fact compatible with determinism at the level of physics. And I'll here basically just sketch why uh, I, I think so. So, um, I, as I've argued in a series of works, um, of which I'll just give you a very, very, very brief uh, overview in a moment, the distinction between determinism and indeterminism um, is best understood as a level relative distinction. So, I think it is not meaningful to ask is the world deterministic or indeterministic as such? Um, rather, this question becomes meaningful only once we specify the level of description relative to which we are asking that question. In particular, and I'll give you a toy example to illustrate this point in a second, a system can be deterministic at one level, such as the level of fundamental physics, and indeterministic at, an, uh, at another level, such as the level of some special science, for instance, biology, psychology, sociology, or whatever it might be. When we move from a lower microscopic level to a higher macroscopic level, we may see a kind of phase transition from deterministic to indeterministic dynamics. Or as Jeremy Butterfield, the philosopher of physics, puts it, a system's micro and macro level dynamics um, need not mesh, as a little toy example now will, will illustrate. Related results have also been obtained by Jeffrey Yoshimi and Charlotte Vandel. He so here's a simple toy example just to make the point. Um, here I've um, presented a very simple system over five time periods, from time one at the bottom to time five at the top. The little dots um, represent states that the system can be in at a particular point in time, and then the um, lines from bottom to top um, are trajectories that the system can take. Um, now, um, and for the moment, uh, forget about the, the grid, just look at the dots and the trajectories. Um, what you will see here is that if we take this to be the system's entire set of nomologically possible trajectories uh, under different initial uh, configurations for different initial states, then the initial segment of any of these trajectories up to any point in time 
admits only one continuation among the possible trajectories here. And this is precisely the sense in which you've got determinism. If you fix the state at time one, you have thereby, under the laws governing the system, fixed all the subsequent uh, states um, as, as well. Um, on, and graphically speaking, there's no branching in any of those trajectories. Okay, so far so good. Now let's suppose we um, look at this system, not at this um, micro level, which is meant to be represented here, but at the macro level associated, let's say, with some special science, um, where um, at the macro level, macro states are more coarse grained than micro states. Macro states um, supervene on micro states, but they are multiply realizable at the micro level. So more than one distinct micro state can realize the same macro state. Um, and um, this is not just. Uh, a point about macro descriptions somehow being informationally um, sparser and leaving out some micro details of which we're ignorant. But uh, it may also simply be that in order to even pick up and identify uh, certain important and salient macro regularities, a certain level of ab abstraction is explanatorily necessary. So in order to see macro regularities and macro patterns, we need to throw out some micro-level inf information, and um, only then do we see the macroscopically relevant features of the system. So just for the purposes of this very simple toy example, let's then suppose that um, any microstates that fall within the same um, cell within this rectangular grid are competing or <laughs> alternative realizers uh, of the um, of the same macrostate. So basically, uh, microstates that fall within the same cell uh, here are mapped to exactly the same macrostate, whereas microstates that fall within different cells in this grid are mapped to different macrostates. So this gives you a full definition of what the supervenience mapping looks like that takes you from microstates to macrostates. Now let's look at the resulting macrostates and macro histories. Um, so b basically, all that I've done here is I've started with these micro histories. I've specified a supervenience mapping from micro to macro um, states, and I, I've looked at the image of these micro histories um, under the supervenience mapping. You get the resulting macro histories, and you see immediately that those macro histories now do display branching, and the macro histories are indeterministic in the macro level sense in that um, the same initial segment of a macro level history up to some point in time may admit different um, possible continuations among the um, available macro histories here. So just forget about the micro picture for the moment and just look at the macro picture and then the definition of indeterminism is clearly met here at the macro level. So conditional, for instance, on the macro state at the bottom left here, there are several possible ways in which the macro history then can evolve. Um, so this is just a sort of proof of concept to show that the um, determinism, indeterminism distinction is not preserved under uh, changes in uh, the level of description of a, of a system. That's the bottom line. And this proof of concept then allows us to see that there need not be a conflict between the agential indeterminism presupposed by our intentional explanations in the special sciences and physical determinism. You could have both at the same time. So you could have physical determinism and at the same time at the agential level things could look like this and um, you can still be a standard supervenience physicalist and accept all of this. Um, indeed, um, just for the record, I want to mention that lower level indeterminism is neither necessary nor even sufficient for higher level um, indeterminism. So you could also have the con converse configuration with indeterminism at the lower level and determinism at the higher level. The point is precisely that the determinism indeterminism distinction has to be drawn in a level specific way rather than once and for all. 
More generally, it would be a mistake to think that there is just one single modal notion of possibility, such as physical possibility, which is then somehow applicable to all domains of inquiry and to all levels of analysis. Rather, there are different level-specific modal notions which are given to us by, by our best explanatory theories at those different levels. Agential possibility is simply the modal notion to which our best theories of intentional agency are committed. And indeed, someone who has um, made a somewhat related um, point um, is uh, John Mayer in a nice paper on the agentive modalities in which he actually argues that there is a very distinctive modal notion that is associated with agency and, and choice, which is defined in terms of option availability and which he takes to be a sort of primitive uh, modal notion. I mean, from the perspective of my framework here, we need not even uh, say that agen agential possibility has to be a sort of primitive modal notion because we can give a story about how it hangs together with physical possibility via this levels construction that I've very quickly run through. But on the sort of big picture, that, uh, namely that um, th there is a level-specific modal notion relevant to the analysis of what agents can and cannot do, uh, there is very much common ground between my analysis and, and uh, John Mayer's analysis of agentive modalities. So agential possibility is the modal notion that comes from our best theories of agency, just as chemical and biological possibility are the modal notions to which our best chemical and biological theories are committed. And the determinism-indeterminism distinction at each level must then be drawn in terms of the appropriate level-specific modal notion, which, and this is equally crucial, must be applied to states and trajectories specified at the relevant level. So we also cannot say things like, you know, what is agentially possible conditional on such and such a physical microstate, because then we'd be doing some kind of problematic level mixing. Um, the, even for the definition of agential possibility, the relevant um, accessibility relations between possible worlds or possible trajectories are defined for the coarse-grained higher-level trajectories rather than the fine-grained lower-level trajectories. So let me wrap up. I've considered two lines of argument to suggest that agency itself, and not just free agency, requires alternative possibilities and thereby a form of indeterminism. I've looked at Stuart's um, argument from settling, but this would establish a sort of very thorough agency and compatibilism, <laughs> even with physical determinism. I've suggested that there are some compatibilist responses to this available, but then I've um, endorsed a more naturalistic argument for agency incompatibilism at the agential level, but crucially I've yeah, suggested that um, this need not establish a conflict between agency and physical determinism. So the challenge for a thoroughgoing compatibilist is to show where both arguments um, go wrong. The position to which I'm clearly drawn based on all of this is that agency doesn't require full-blown physical indeterminism of the sort that Stuart's view would require, but agency does indeed require and involve agential indeterminism, which is a higher level form of indeterminism that can still coexist with lower level determinism. Thank you. Okay, they actually, we have time for some questions. Um, five, two, uh, two will be a teoria reception outside in the cafeteria, but we, can, we have time for that. Can you, you start? Uh, thank you very much. I'm here. Um, so um, one question. So don't you have to reject token identity in order for your argument to work to show that um, agency and determinism is compatible with physical determinism? So the short answer is, I mean, if, if the, I mean, of course, token identity could be spelled out in a variety of ways, but if token identity means that um, even when we speak about agency, we must always, um, in the background, somehow be able to conditionalize on the underlying realizing physical microstate, if that's what token identity would commit us to, then I'd not be able to run through my argument. So what is crucial for my argument is the idea of taking the separation between different levels quite quite seriously and uh, 
very carefully separating the micro from the, um, from, from the macro level. Um, so I have to concede a version of your point, but I don't think that this is, um, is problematic because I would want to argue that even type token distinctions, once you take on board this sort of leveled ontology, may have to be rethought uh, or revisited uh, along level-specific lines. Okay, um, Gunnar? Does this work? Oh, yeah, good. Um, yeah, so I have a question about um, why uh, we need agential indeterminism uh, for for the explanatory purposes. So an alternative, you might think that even when at that level an agent's behavior is determined, um, there are still um, notions of possibility that are applicable at that level too. Uh, say you take some compatibilist notion, some classic compatibilist notion of possibility, and say that's the notion that, uh, say, this decision theory needs. Um, it might still be true that a certain agent's behavior in this situation is determined by uh, their intentional states uh, at that level, uh, but they have these possibilities in, in a sense uh, that compatibilist has spelled out roughly uh, uh, what they do, uh, which of the things they do is dependent on the relevant uh, st states, the, the relevant intentional states. So, I, I mean, I think there are sort of different ways in which one could take this, this suggestion. I mean, one, one would be, uh, of course, one could try to adopt an anti-realist interpretation of our um, uh, agential explanations and take an anti-realist view of, uh, you know, what it means for some option to be possible or, or available. Now, the anti-realist route I've sort of set aside from the perspective of my realist commitment to those intentional explanations. Another way in which one could take your suggestion would be to say, you know, well, maybe all that is needed for an agent is some subjective or epistemic notion of possibility. Maybe agents need to be able to themselves imagine that there are different options in front of them from, from their subjective perspective, so they need to be able to reason about these imagined options, um, but you know, from the external objective perspective, uh, only one of those options was, was, was ever available in the, in the first place. Um, but I would consider this a kind of error-theoretic reinterpretation of what decision-theoretic or intentional explanations say, and I also feel that it would not quite do justice to some distinctions that um, uh, we sometimes draw in our explanatory practice in intentional explanation. So for instance, game theorists um, often uh, like to have an explicit model of a decision maker's subjective view of a choice situation and contrast this with a sort of objective nature of the choice situation as uh, represented by the modeler who has a sort of more Olympian understanding of this. And um, the, the thought is that, for instance, the decision maker may fail to distinguish certain situations subjectively from one another, which the, the modeler can nonetheless objectively dis distinguish. And if this is so, then um, the decision theoretic modeler thereby recognizes that there is an important distinction to be drawn between options as they look subjectively from the agent's perspective and options as they look objectively from the perspective of the, of, of the scientific theory. And that, to me, already uh, it counts as evidence for saying that a, a purely subjectivist interpretation of the options would, would, would lose something. Um, so my feeling is your kind of proposal, while when I'm, I'm not doubting that this could be made coherent, I'm not doubting its coherence, but I would suggest that this pushes, will push us either in a sort of anti-realist or instrumentalist uh, understanding of intentional explanations or in an error-theoretic direction. And for my kind of realism, neither of those would be attractive rules. Thanks, I'll follow up later. Yeah. Uh, Richard? Can you yes. Um, Yes, I think this is this is very close to Gunnar's question. 
um, making a slightly different proposal that is definitely not subjectivist. So how about um, understanding those possibilities in terms of variations of agents? So you say um, Luther for sure couldn't make a different decision, but if he was another man, and there are other, another man, man, people in this world, then he could have uh, decided differently. How, how, why would you rule out such, a, such an approach? Well, I think in, <clears throat> I mean, in, in, let's say if we wanted to give a decision theoretic explanation of, of Luther, what we really want to um, explain is what choice Luther makes between different um, uh, options that are available to him, not um, which um, you know, variation of Luther with a corresponding option for that variation uh, is sort of the actual one. So it's kind of st structurally, this is is quite different. So in in the um, this in the decision theoretic or game theoretic explanation, you've got one agent with a non singleton option set, and in this reinterpretation, what you'd have is kind of um, a, a, a family of subtly different you know parallel agents in in, in different possible worlds, which are you know, modal variations of one another each of whom is just associated with one corresponding option. So you'd have different agent variations combined with a single option. And what you'd somehow have to then explain is, you know, which of these agent variation option pairs is, is the actual one. And it strikes me that at least structurally, this is a sort of very different explanation from the, from the standard game theoretic or decision theoretic or intentional one. And, and for this reason, again, I would, I'm not denying that this can be made coherent, but again, it strikes me as a sort of anti-realist, non-standard um, reinterpretation. And I'm afraid we have to have to stop there. So we have to continue the discussion in the theory reception, which will be out in the cafeteria. But before we leave, thank you for a very interesting talk and discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much.